Hi guys, today I wanted to talk to you about the link between the gut microbiome and cardiovascular disease. It all comes down to this compound called TMAO or trimethylamine N oxide. TMAO is a predictor for cardiovascular disease, so we actually use it as a marker. We'll test serum TMAO to see if you are at risk for cardiovascular disease, and depending on how high TMAO is, it will predict the likelihood or your, the risk for death from cardiovascular disease. Um, so this is something to take really seriously. Uh, TMAO is also associated with blood clotting, heart attack, and stroke. It increases with age, typically, uh, and it causes oxidative stress. So we can also compare the levels of TMAO to oxidative stress markers. It increases inflammation in your blood vessels, leading to blood vessel lining dysfunction. It impairs your glucose tolerance and insulin signaling, and it promotes adipose tissue inflammation. So there's a lot of mechanisms via which TMAO can um, promote cardiovascular disease or increase your risk for <clears throat> for um, more a more severe experience or even death from cardiovascular disease. So let's talk about how this happens. How do we end up with TMAO in our body in the first place? Well, it all starts with specific food compounds. So um, these compounds include choline, betaine, lecithin, and carnitine, um, which happen to be present in um, mostly animal-based foods. So we're going to talk about that. Um, so we eat those foods. We eat those compounds. They travel through to our intestines. And then our microbes have a go at them. And specific microbes are able to ferment those food compounds compounds into something called TMA. Once TMA is produced, then TMA uh, can uh, make it into systemic circulation. It'll travel to the liver, and then the liver will decide if TMA becomes TMAO. Um, so that's the whole cycle for um, food items becoming TMAO in the body. But let's jump back to the microbe situation for a second. So which microbes are capable of turning those food compounds into TMA? So the microbes, they have to um, be genetically endowed to produce the enzymes to turn betaine, lecithin, carnitine, choline into TMA. And there's not a ton of microbes that we know of that are um, actually capable of doing this, and they don't always carry the genes to do so. But here is a um, short and simplified list of the microbes that uh, we know potentially are capable of doing so, and you can go to the blog um, I have a blog post on this subject for the complete list with the species and strain names. I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce them because it'll just be a jumble of words. Um, and I think you're better off just reading through the list that I've created for you. So uh, we have a number of Bacteroides species, or rather strains, uh, including certain Bacteroides ovatus strains, Bacteroides theta micron strains, Colincera, or Colincella, Eubacterium, Enerococcus, Clostridium, so a couple Clostridium strains, Edwardsiella, uh, Proteus, Providencia, and Disulfovibrio. So one Disulfovibrio species actually that's capable of producing TMA. So once TMA has been produced, like I said, it enters systemic circulation. It goes to the liver where the enzyme flavin monooxygenase is the enzyme that generates TMAO from TMA. Um, just a side note that's kind of interesting. Females actually have more of this enzyme activity than males. Um, so just a, just a point there out of interest and comparison. But... Let's now talk about the important part of all of this. So how can you actually reduce TMAO in the body? And first we'll talk about what you can't do. Um, so your first thought might be, well, let's start with removing the sources. So the things that actually turn into TMAO. So you might be thinking, okay, let's, let's reduce choline, lecithin, carnitine, and betaine in the diet. And then the microbes can't produce TMA and then there's less TMA to turn into TMAO. Um, so 
there have actually been studies and and clinical trials where we did this and um, we found out that this doesn't actually work for a number of reasons. So if you think about the quality of these food compounds, I mean, they're so important um, for certain detox pathways for methylation, for example, um, betaine, carnitine, um, they're both involved in methylation and mitochondrial health. And uh, these compounds are involved in inflammation reduction as well. So without their presence, we would see inflammation markers go up. And like I said before, the more your inflammation markers go up, the more TMAO production at the liver likely goes up too. Um, so studies found that this, this method did not work To So why didn't these studies work? Well, it's like I said, so these compounds are involved in inflammation reduction, they're involved in methylation, um, and it could be just the difference as well in individual microbiomes. So um, also the capacity of the microbes to metabolize different things, just because you remove choline, for example, which is one of the things that these microbes might metabolize and might use as fuel, doesn't mean the entirety of their fuel sources are gone. It just means that one item is gone. So some of those microbes that I listed, for example, we know are mucus feeders. If you remove choline, they may just go ahead and feed on mucus. Um, Desulfo vibrio, for example, may go ahead and feed on some other source of sulfur, for example. So each microbe, um, species, genus, strain, they're all capable of metabolizing usually multiple fuel sources. Um, so just because you reduce one or eliminate one doesn't mean that they're gonna disappear automatically. There are other health aspects which have been found to increase or decrease TMAO. For example, gastric bypass actually increases TMAO and sleep deprivation can increase TMAO as well. Um, so we know sleep deprivation is considered a stressor for the body and it can alter the microbiome uh, and it also may alter our inflammation levels. To research when it comes to um, the nutrition versus TMAO levels just to give you, you an idea of the mixed research on this subject. So um, a number of clinical trials have tried looking at eggs and the connection of uh, between eggs and TMAO levels. Um, so one study uh, found that egg yolks, which are rich in choline, um, so eating more than two eggs per day seemed to increase TMAO, le TMAO levels, but this was only in six subjects, so very small study size, and can we really refer to this? Um, likely not. Another study using 38 subjects found that the intake of three eggs per day did not increase TMAO levels, but had beneficial effects such as increasing HDL cholesterol and choline. Um, so there's one, one example of just the mixed research in this area. Dairy consumption has been associated with higher TMAO levels in 271 subjects. And then in 38 overweight or um, obese women, increased consumption of dairy resulted in lower TMAO levels. So really interesting the contrast that's happening here. Um, and potentially um, being reflective of this idea that um, if you're overweight or obese, you have a, your microbiome is gonna look different. So you may metabolize things differently. Curious, you can actually measure your own TMAO levels. Um, so if you go to LabCorp, um, you may be able to get this covered by your insurance. Uh, if you don't have insurance, you can run Serum TMAO for about $100 at LabCorp or through the, um, the Lab Boston Diagnostics for about $60. Now let's look at some of the things that have been found to reduce TMAO. So studies have found that a Mediterranean diet uh, in a study with just about over 150 people, um, those who adhered to a Mediterranean diet had lower TMAO levels than those who did not adhere to the diet. What about supplementation? So if you supplement vitamin D and uh, a B complex, this can potentially decrease your TMAO levels as well. If you eat more pistachios, um, this may decrease TMAO levels. So that one is a pretty easy thing to do, 
increasing the amount of pistachio in your diet. If you eat pomegranate and cranberry, the tannins from pomegranate and the polyphenols in cranberry seem to alter the microbiome in such a way that um, it reduces TMAO production, and I'm sure it works systemically as well, so pomegranate tends to be very anti-inflammatory. Using fresh and dried herbs when you cook animal proteins. So a number of herbs uh, we know have an antimicrobial effect against some of the microbes, even the ones that I listed above, especially oregano, thyme, and rosemary. So those are great to cook with and uh, have the potential to reduce TMAO. Increasing prebiotics and subsequently increasing the competition for TMA producing microbes seems to work. Um, so in one study, it reduced TMAO by over 60%. Um, and then studies have compared different types of prebiotics. So a single prebiotic doesn't tend to work as well as a um, blend of prebiotics. And this is likely because you need a fair amount of competition to reduce the TMA producers. While we're still talking about TMA, I wanted to lead into the subject of trimethylamine urea, which is a rare condition where TMA builds up in the body, the body can't process it or eliminate it properly, and that results in the person smelling like stale fish. Um, now, if you think about the smell of rotten fish, this happens in fish and it happens in humans too if they have this genetic predisposition um, and as well as, well, what I think to be the microbiome that um, essentially pulls the trigger of the genetic predisposition. Um, so I have worked, I had one client who had this condition, um, for him, it wasn't at the, it wasn't anywhere near the top of his list of symptoms and it seemed to be transient for him. So this was back when I was in maybe my first or second year working in the integrative medicine field and still working 100%, um, mainly doing, uh, working with the fecal microbiota transplant. And so... This client had come for our FMT program. Um, he was with us for about two to three weeks, and it wasn't until we were partway through his program that he began telling me about this. Um, now, for me, the smell wasn't that noticeable, but considering what we were doing, there were a lot of other smells happening. Um, but I, I didn't notice it, and for him, he's like, okay, well, it's like down here on my list of issues um, that I'm hoping the FMT will address. And at that time, we were like, okay, well, I mean, it would be pretty experimental. I mean, hopefully it reduces your symptoms, the symptoms go away, but obviously we can't make any guarantees or predictions as to what will happen. Um, and so he completes his program, he goes home, and then I check in on him three months later, and the symptoms are completely gone. Um, so symptoms have gone from maybe like a 6 or 7 out of 10 to now a 0 out of 10. Um, so I think this just goes to say that definitely working on the microbiome is worth your time if you have trimethylamine urea. Um, there are obviously different ways that you can do that. You don't have to do FMT. Um, you can do microbiome modulation in other ways. So considering the things that I mentioned earlier on in the video. Um, I think it's also important to consider, if you're thinking about FMT, think about the different ways or methods of administration for FMT. Um, at that time, we were only doing enemas, uh, which only addresses the colon, and different people are going to have different dysbiosis in different areas of the intestines. I mean, the colon is only five, six feet long, and yes, if you do FMT in one area, it may influence the other areas, um, but the small intestine is 20 to 25 feet long, and in my experience, experience people. Um, the, the issues, dysbiosis in the small intestine is a lot more <laughs> frequent than it is in the colon. Um, and then depending on what's happening in the small intestine, you may um, not want to use certain methods of administration with FMT. Um, yeah, that's kind of, I just wanted to share my thought process on the whole trimethylamineuria subject and encourage you guys to look into microbiome modulation through 
whatever means that you can. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, if you found it helpful, definitely give me a thumbs up. Uh, if you like the content and want more, I post more frequently on Instagram. I do write blog posts. Um, if you have any ideas as to other subjects I should cover, definitely let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to get out the content with I can when I can. Uh, and definitely you're welcome to book a video consultation with me through my website as well. And uh, yeah, that's it for today. Heart disease and TMAO. I hope this was helpful for you and helps you prevent cardiovascular disease in yourself and your loved ones. All right. Bye for now.